Governments around the world are addicted to debt. You don't need to get rid of government debt. The private debt and private markets are just as big a problem. Private debt is way bigger than government debt. So why don't we hear about the dangers of private debt? According to mainstream economists, there are no dangers. This is completely wrong. The economy essentially blows up. Really big private busts cause explosion of government debt. We need to reduce the level of private debt. My proposal is to use the capacity of the government to create money to enable households to drastically reduce their debt levels. A modern debt jubilee. Well, not a day goes by, barely a second it seems, without some sage warning about the dangers of America's huge level of government debt. And on the other hand, you hardly ever hear a mention of private debt. So government debt must be far bigger than private debt, right? Wrong. In the United States and almost all developed countries, private debt is way bigger than government debt. As this graph shows, before the global financial crisis, government debt was relatively low at 60% of GDP, while private debt at 170% of GDP was almost three times higher. Government debt has risen since, both in reaction to the GFC and because of COVID, but even so, it's still lower than private debt. So why don't we hear about the dangers of private debt? Well, it's because according to mainstream economists, there are no dangers. This is completely wrong, as the data itself shows. Economic crises are caused by excessive private debt, not excessive government debt. They occur when credit, which is the annual change in the level of private debt, turns negative at the time of an already high level of private debt. The economic boom before the GFC was caused by credit rising from just 2% of GDP at the end of the 1990s recession to 15% at the height of the subprime bubble in 2006. Then credit plunged from 15% of GDP to minus 5% by 2009. And this is what caused the GFC, or the Great Recession, as Americans call it. Now, the first person to realise that private debt and not government debt was the main cause of economic depressions. Wasn't Keynes, as you might expect, but Irving Fisher. Unfortunately, these days, Fisher is mainly remembered for his statement just before the great crash of 1929. And by the way, if you want to use my proprietary software Ravel for economic analysis too, you get it as a free bonus inside my seven-week Rebel Economist Challenge, like over 600 people have already done. To learn more, apply at stevekeen.com. Stock prices have reached a permanently high plateau and that he expected to see the stock market a good deal higher than it is today within a few months. Well, one week later, the market fell by 10% in one day and he was wiped out. But in the aftermath of the Great Crash, Fisher realised that what had led him astray was the neoclassical assumption that equilibrium was the rule in a capitalist economy. Instead, he argued disequilibrium was the rule. He reasoned that even if you assume that economic variables tended towards equilibrium, this is a quote, new disturbances are, humanly speaking, short to occur so that in actual fact any variable is almost always above or below the ideal equilibrium. Theoretically there must be over or under production, over or under consumption and over or under everything else. It is as absurd to assume that the variables in the economic organisation will stay put in perfect equilibrium as to assume that the Atlantic Ocean can never be without a wave. He then asserted that the Great Depression was caused by over indebtedness to start with and deflation following soon after. And he was dead right. So why didn't we learn from Fisher and control private debt. It's mainly because mainstream economists like Ben Bernanke rejected Fisher's argument, not because it was wrong, but because it contradicted the neoclassical theory of banking. To quote Bernanke on this front, academic economists ignored Fisher's analysis because of the counter-argument that debt deflation represented no more than a redistribution from one group, debtors, to another group, creditors. Absent implausibly large differences in marginal spending propensities among the groups, it was suggested pure redistributions should have no significant macro economic effects. Well, as I've shown in previous posts, this is a fallacy because the neoclassical model of banking itself is a fallacy. Banks are not mere intermediaries who enable savers to lend to borrowers. They are creators of both debt and money. Lending is not a pure redistribution, but a creation of new money and spending power. When lending turns negative, which happened in the global financial crisis and the Great Depression, when debt has turned from borrowing to repaying debt, or they're going bankrupt and they're unable to repay their debt, the economy crashes. This is what happened in both the Great Depression and the Great Recession. So therefore, thanks to neoclassical economists, rather than learning from history, we repeated it. Private debt, which had peaked at about 130% of GDP in the early 1930s, fell to just 50% at the end of World War II. But then it rose, it peaked at 170% of GDP in 2007, crashed again, and we repeated the experience of the 1930s. Now, I knew that the global financial crisis was about to happen because I built on the work of Hyman Minsky, who in turn built on the work of Irving Fisher to create what he called the financial instability hypothesis. Now Bernanke, on the other hand, ignored Minsky even more than he ignored Fisher. He got the job as Federal Reserve Chairman because he marked
marketed himself as the expert on the Great Depression, but he wasn't the expert on the Great Depression. He was instead the expert on explanations for the Great Depression that are consistent with neoclassical economic theory. And the only explanation that's consistent is the Fed did it. It's government that caused the problem. That's precisely what he asserted in a cringeworthy speech that he gave at Milton Friedman's 90th birthday party, where he said, and this is again a quote, let me end my talk by abusing slightly my status as an official representative of the Federal Reserve. I would like to say to Milton and Anna, regarding the Great Depression, you're right, we did it, we're very sorry, but thanks to you, we won't do it again. Now, honestly, I could puke, not only at how obsequious that statement was, but also because he was profoundly wrong about what caused the Great Depression, and this was just before the global financial crisis began, who claimed to be an expert on the Great Depression, but in reality he had no idea of why it happened. Now, in the aftermath to the crisis that he didn't see coming, Bernanke borrowed an idea from Richard Werner and Japan of quantitative easing, and he justified it this way. The idea behind quantitative easing is to provide banks with substantial excess liquidity in the hope that they will choose to use some of part of this liquidity to make loans or buy other assets. Such purchases should in principle both raise asset prices and increase the growth of the broad measures of money, which may in turn induce households and businesses to buy non-money assets or to spend more on goods and services. Well, this explanation shows how the little Bernanke and neoclassical economists in general understand the banking system. For starters, banks cannot lend out reserves. The money multiplier is another neoclassical myth. Secondly, banks can't buy other assets because one of the few things we learned from the Great Depression was that it's a very bad idea to let banks buy shares. One reason the Great Depression was so much worse than the Great Recession was that back then banks were allowed to buy shares. And when the stock market fell 10% in one day, and then by almost 90%, over the following three years, many banks were sent bankrupt. The Glass-Steagall Act banned banks from buying shares, and rightly so. Today, only non-bank financial institutions, pension funds, insurance companies, vampire squids, can buy shares and property, and bond purchases from them under QE definitely did inflate asset prices. But the main thing Bernanke's statement shows is that mainstream economists are so oblivious to the dangers of private debt that in the middle of a crisis caused by too much private debt, they thought that it was a good idea to encourage the private sector to get into yet more debt. Consequently, the deleveraging after the global financial crisis has been far smaller than what happened after the crash of 1929. Private debt in 1945 was 75% lower than it was when the debt ratio peaked in 1932. It fell from 132% of GDP in 1932 to 34% in 1945. Now that's what enabled the golden age of capitalism in the 1950s and 60s to, to occur. Low levels of private debt meant that people spent freely, not worrying about having to service their debts. But since 2007, private debt has fallen just 15% compared to its peak. So, with private debt higher than it's ever been outside the GFC itself, credit-based demand is stagnant, and so is the economy. At the same time, thanks to the Fed's support for asset price bubbles, share prices off the scale, and houses are out of reach of young people. Both have been driven by private debt as well as by quantitative easing. Margin debt is at its highest level since the Great Depression. Stock market valuations are higher than in 1929, and at their highest level in history since the dot-com bust of 2000. Now, this has benefited the wealthy, who own shares, and it's penalised the poor, who don't. Yes, the poor have some shares in their 401ks and so on, but the, the actual scale is trivial. Similarly, the failure to deliver after the GFC has meant that house prices, which did fall substantially because of it, have now risen again back to a higher level than they reached at the time of the GFC. This again has benefited the wealthy and penalised the poor. If we're ever going to have a healthy economy again and affordable housing, we need to reduce the level of private debt and make sure that any future lending supports the real economy rather than inflating asset bubbles. But that gives us a real dilemma. Reducing private debt will almost certainly cause asset prices to fall, but the financial health of many baby boomers depends upon asset prices remaining high. At the same time, high asset prices lock young people out of buying a home. So how do we thread the needle? Well, almost two decades ago now, I proposed a solution, a modern debt jubilee. Our current crop of politicians will never implement it, but it's possible that when the majority of Americans are unable to buy a home, politicians might listen to the majority rather than to the wealthy. Now, a modern debt jubilee can't operate in the same way that ancient debt jubilees did. In ancient societies, private debt turned 
farmers into debt slaves who lost their land and had to go and work on the land of their creditors. But because only freemen could become soldiers, this in turn meant that those societies were in jeopardy of being invaded by their rivals. Now today we can't just write off private debt for two good reasons. Firstly, that would cause a collapse in the money supply and send the banking sector into bankruptcy. Secondly, benefiting just debtors would penalise those people who didn't engage in the speculative manias that have driven house prices and asset prices so high. My proposal is to use the capacity of the government to create money to enable households to drastically reduce their debt levels. The government would create the money in precisely the same way that it finances deficit spending now by going into negative financial equity, which creates identical positive financial equity for the non-government sectors. The funds would go equally to every working age adult. Now, as a rough guide, there are about 200 million Americans of working age, and the United States household debt level now is about $20 trillion. So the jubilee amount could be $100,000 per person, which would be sufficient to eliminate household debt completely, as the ancient jubilees used to do. Now, in the jubilee, those who have any debt at all would be required to pay their debt down. Those without debt would be required to use the funds to buy jubilee bonds, which would then give those households an income stream. As well as reducing the level of private debt, this would revert some of the increase in inequality that has occurred over the last half century under the flawed economic policies of mainstream economists like Bernanke. Because the Jubilee would be a per capita payment, the top 0.1% of the population would get 0.1% of the funds and the bottom 99.9% would get 99.9% of the funds. And it would be the same per person. Elon Musk and an unemployed single mother would both get $100,000. There would be no increase in the money supply because the money created by the Jubilee would be offset by the requirements that funds had to be used either to pay debt down or to buy Jubilee bonds. Now, this godly table shows the basic ideas from the point of view of the banks. Now, to the extent that this policy caused house prices to fall, homeowners would be compensated by the decrease in their debts. And this would happen without having to sell the house in the first place. At the moment, when people say the houses are worth, say, a million dollars, to actually realise that valuation, they have to sell the house. With this scheme, they get $100,000 now per person without having having to sell. Uh, in a later video, I'll simulate this model to show how a modern debt jubilee could reverse most of the policy mistakes of by neoclassical economists thanks to their failure to understand the monetary system. In the meantime, please share this video around. It's time we overthrew the useless, dangerous advice that neoclassical economists give us about how to manage an economy that they don't understand in the first place. Like many other truth seekers, I want to learn 50 years of real economics from me in only seven weeks. You'll love my new seven-week Rebel Economist Challenge as well. To apply, go to stevecane.com. If you qualify, you can attend my lectures, ask me questions personally every week, and make friends with a great group of like-minded people. So again, like many others, go to stevecane.com to apply as well for the seven-week Rebel Economist Challenge. Good luck.